Hello and welcome to this presentation on the introduction to clinical reasoning. This presentation is part of PT 516, Clinical Problem Solving and Musculoskeletal Rehabilitation. And I'm Dr. Jack Statura. I'll be the narrator for this presentation. So as we begin our discussion of clinical reasoning, uh, we've listed here some learning objectives that you should be able to take away from this presentation. So first, we need to be able to understand the timeline of clinical decision making. When does clinical decision making actually begin? You will learn to be able to define clinical reasoning, to identify and explain variables that affect clinical reasoning, to discuss hypothesis-oriented decision making with respect to hypothesis categories, to compare and contrast diagnostic versus narrative reasoning, to explain the value of reassessment in the reasoning process, to discuss pattern recognition with respect to clinical reasoning, to appreciate the need for collaboration in clinical reasoning, to discuss the various types of knowledge involved in the clinical reasoning process, to understand causes and categories of clinical reasoning errors, to be able to identify and explain cl common clinical reasoning errors and to identify and understand ways to improve the clinical reasoning process. So by the completion of this presentation, you should have a good concept of all of these learning objectives and how they relate to the clinical reasoning process and ultimately our clinical decision making relative to our patient interventions and strategies. So when does the clinical reasoning process begin? The clinical reasoning process really starts when you're handed a new patient's file and you open that file for the very first time. There's information contained within that file that will begin your thought process, your clinical reasoning process, you're beginning to develop hypotheses about your patient. So pause this presentation now and take out a sheet of paper and begin to write down some information that you think you may find in your charts or information that you recall from your clinical internships that you found in the patient's chart that may be valuable information to help you begin the clinical reasoning process and beginning to develop uh, diagno um, hypotheses for your patient. Within that patient file, you're going to find demographic information. Knowing the patient's age or perhaps knowing their ethnic background may be important pieces of information to help you with your prognosis for that particular patient. Uh, for example, it's well known and documented that folks from northern and eastern European descent typically have a higher tolerance to pain than folks from southern Europe. Knowing and understanding a patient's work history may be important in helping you create a hypothesis or a prognosis about them, especially if they're coming to you with a work-related injury. Knowing a patient's past medical history will provide many, many clues as to how quickly they may resolve from their problem if there may be comorbidities and other issues that you have to pay attention to relative to your treatment strategies. Any outcome tools or surveys that are provided to the patient will give you valuable information relative to the specific problem that you're attempting to intervene with. So these outcome tools provide very valuable information to help you create a prognosis as well as intervention strategies. And you're likely going to find the physician's prescription within your chart. And that prescription from the physician may provide a medical diagnosis as well as precautions that the physician would like you to undertake relative to your patient intervention. However, many times the physician's prescription simply will provide a medical diagnosis and offer you the professional opportunity to evaluate and treat as necessary. So there's a lot of information that's presented to us within the patient's chart before we even see the patient that will allow us to begin the clinical reasoning process and to begin the process of developing a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses about this particular patient's problem. What then is clinical reasoning? According to Higgs and Jones, clinical reasoning is really a process in which the therapist interacting with the patient and significant others structures meaning, goals, and health management strategies based upon client data, client choices, and professional judgment and knowledge. So looking at this definition, you see that there's a lot of pieces within it. Uh, as it says in the beginning, clinical reasoning is a process 
And this process takes place not just with the therapist, but also it's a collaborative process between the therapist, the patient, and any other healthcare providers and significant others that may be part of this patient's uh, treatment strategy. It's throughout this process then that we look at data and we try to structure meaning from that data. And in collaboration with the patient then, we develop goals and management strategies in an effort to uh, resolve their symptoms. We bring to the process, we as the clinicians bring to the process, our ability to analyze data as well as our professional judgment and knowledge. Within this clinical reasoning process, there are variables that will affect this whole system. And the first of that are attributes of the therapist. And so attributes of the therapist, for example, are things such as the breadth and depth and organization of the knowledge that the physical therapist brings to the table due to their past experience as well as their educational experiences. The therapist brings familiarity and experience based upon the type of case that they're about to intervene with as well as reasoning proficiency, teaching skills, and communication skills. The therapist also brings with them attributes such as psychomotor skills. These are referred to as professional craft skills. Skills by you impart directly upon the patient in an effort to resolve their symptoms. So these are all considered attributes of the therapist. I'm sure if you take time you can think of other attributes of the therapist that may play an important role in this critical reasoning process as well. Then there's attributes that the patient brings to the table. And these attributes are things such as their beliefs and their attitudes, uh, their particular needs, uh, their psychosocial circumstances, including their capacity and willingness to participate in the clinical decision-making process and in the management of their own problem. So the patient brings significant attributes to the table which will directly influence the outcome of the clinical reasoning process as well as their treatment strategy. We also have attributes of the environment. And here we're looking at things such as resources, time, funding, uh, and any externally imposed professional or regulatory requirements that may be uh, imparted upon you as the clinician. So when we look at the attributes of the therapist in combination with the attributes of the patient and the attributes of the environment, we can begin to see that there's many pieces to this puzzle that need to be understood and utilized effectively if we are to have an efficient and effective clinical reasoning process. Clinical reasoning then is a hypothesis-oriented reasoning problem. And when we look at this hypothesis-oriented reasoning, what we're really looking at is this reflective process uh, whereby patient information is analyzed through a conscious attempt to relate pieces of information to recognizable patterns or to new and unrecognizable patterns that are unique to that patient. So as we go through the clinical reasoning process, beginning with opening the patient's chart, we're already beginning to create hypotheses based upon the data that we're collecting. And as the process continues, we may generate more than one hypothesis that needs further testing. And this is all part of the clinical reasoning process, as we'll see. But a good component of this clinical reasoning process is reflection. And we'll talk about this reflective process in a few minutes. So when are the hypotheses about our patients actually formed? Well, as I said earlier, we begin to uh, formulate hypotheses during a pre-patient contact. So when we first open a patient's chart, there's information within that chart that begins the clinical decision-making process and begins the formation of hypotheses about our particular patient. It's during direct patient contact that we go through the subjective and, exe and objective examination. And it's during the subjective and objective examination time that we gather a significant amount of data about our patients, which helps us to begin to collect relative information uh, and relevant information about our patient's problem. During the direct patient contact, we begin to formulate hypotheses. And based upon those hypotheses, we then look at particular tests and measures that need to be done 
to help us either accept or reject the hypothesis that we're beginning to formulate. In post-patient contact, we then go back and analyze and sort out this information, the data that we've collected, in an attempt to try to formulate some opinion using clin clinical and critical decision-making process to finalize hypotheses that have been formed. It is through the process of reassessment then that we can help to confirm or disprove the hypotheses that we've generated during this initial patient uh, contact and this initial patient examination process. When we go through critical reasoning, we utilize two forms of reasoning, diagnostic and narrative reasoning. And diagnostic reasoning then is understanding and managing the patient's problem to affect change by using procedural management. And what we mean by procedural management is going through the process of objective thinking, utilizing tests and measures that are available to us, utilizing clinical knowledge gained through our educational experience and our uh, clinical experience to formulate uh, some type of a hypothesis and some type of a decision relative to the patient's problem. So as this example shows, if we have a patient with an impingement syndrome who comes to us with suggestion of impingement syndrome, we have multiple tests that we can put the patient through, and depending upon whether the tests prove positive or negative, can help us formulate a, an opinion using a decision-making tree to come up with uh, various hypotheses that may need further testing or may guide our treatment strategy. Narrative reasoning, on the other hand, is understanding and interacting with the patient to affect change by using communicative management. So it's during this process that we take time to talk to our patients, to understand where they're coming from, to understand their goals, their reasons for attending uh, physical therapy in the first place. What is it that they want to achieve as part of the therapy process? We can go through our diagnostic reasoning and come up with a set of hypotheses based upon the data, but we need to help the patient buy into that hypothesis. We need to help the patient buy into our treatment strategies. So it's the narrative reasoning process then that utilizes communication skills and interpersonal skills to help us interact with our patient so that they become part of the process of collaboration in developing goals as well as treatment strategies. So how does reassessment then fit into the reasoning process? Well, every patient encounter, every patient visit should be a reassessment process. And we as physical therapists have the skills and ability to reassess at every patient visit. And so this reassessment initially will provide support for our initial hypothesis. So if we've sent our patient away with a particular intervention strategy and they perform that strategy effectively, it's our hope then that if our initial hypothesis was correct, that there should be some positive response as a result of that intervention. And our reassessment process would demonstrate this positive response. However, if we send our patient away uh, performing the intervention strategy and they come back and they've performed it effectively and there is not a positive response or perhaps there's a negative response, then this reassessment process will signal the need for modifying uh, our hypothesis. Pattern recognition is also an important component of critical reasoning, and it's thought that pattern recognition is a characteristic of all mature thought. In both everyday life as well as in our clinical work, recognizing patterns and storing these patterns in our memory will help us to generate hypotheses and will help us in our clinical decision making. These patterns then form prototypes of frequently experienced situations and it's the ability to pull from our memory this pattern recognition that may assist in our management of our patients. These patterns may be uh, both relative to signs and symptoms of our patients but it also uh, you may also find that there's patterns relative to management strategies associated with 
pathobiological mechanisms, uh, as well as things such as environmental factors, physical factors, psychosocial factors, behavioral and cultural factors that can contribute to the development and the maintenance of our patient's problem. And a good example of this is the case of our patient with a possible shoulder impingement syndrome uh, that we saw before. It's possible that this patient may have a subacrobial impingement and this is based upon this collection of signs and symptoms that we find during our examination process. But it's also possible that there are significantly different common anatomical, biomechanical, or motor patterns that might contribute to this particular syndrome. So while we may see multiple patients who present with the same collection of signs and symptoms, it's important to recognize that there's other contributing factors that can influence the a collection of these signs and symptoms. So pattern recognition is required to begin the process of generating a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses relative to our patient. And then it's testing this hypothesis that provides the means by which these patterns are refined uh, or even prove reliable. And, and in addition to this, looking for patterns with new patients uh, when you present with a patient who may not have a recognizable pattern that you've seen in the past, we'll start to formulate new pattern recognition. So an expert clinician is someone who can take this collection of signs and symptoms uh, and relate these patterns to future patients by storing them in their memory where they can be e easily retrieved. So as we said, patients can have the same diagnostic syndrome, but different pathobiologic mechanisms of injury and different contributing factors. All of these things, though, relate to the ability of the clinician to identify patterns and to utilize this pattern recognition appropriately in developing your intervention strategy. Clinical reasoning uh, is really a collaborative reasoning process. The patient and the therapist have to work as partners in order to develop our treatment strategies and our treatment uh, objectives. So successful management of a patient's problem requires more than just good diagnostic and manual skills. From the first encounter with our patient, we need to be able to utilize our communication skills, our listening skills, uh, our interpersonal skills to be able to assess and manage our patients uh, appropriately. And according to Jones and Reve, psychosocial assessment and management requires uh, skills such as listening, communicating, negotiating, counseling, and motivating our patients. So patients really have to become part of the process in order to effectively manage their situation. As the previous slide suggested, we can recognize patterns within our patients, but Every patient is going to present with different contributing factors that we need to be able to assess and analyze in order to effectively strategize uh, for our patient. At the same time, being able to motivate our patient is critical if we want to uh, provide a positive outcome uh, for this patient intervention. When we talk about reasoning and organized knowledge, it's important to appreciate that many studies over the past uh, two decades have looked at this process of developing expertise across a range of activities. They've looked at people who become experts in chess and engineering, as well as medicine, science, and statistics. And what they have shown that it's not necessarily the command of any particular generic problem-solving strategies or how much knowledge is possessed that really is critical to this process, but rather how that knowledge is organized. 
And so when we talk about types of knowledge, the first is this prepositional knowledge. And this is our biomedical and biopsychosocial knowledge that's often gained uh, through our years in academia, our years taking clinical education courses, uh, reading professional literature on our own. We then have to associate that knowledge with professional craft knowledge. This is the psychomotor skills that we develop with time and the inquiry strategies that we develop with time using our communication skills in talking to our patients and being able to draw out information from our patients. This then is also added to our personal knowledge, our own personal beliefs, our own personal uh, experiences, our own personal values. And it's when we organize this knowledge appropriately, we can then draw from these various components of knowledge that it allows us to utilize the various components of propositional, professional craft, and personal knowledge to best manage our patients uh, and to develop our patient treatment strategies. So once we collect data on our patient and we put this data into some organized structure, we then begin the process of developing hypotheses. And in the case of manual therapy, there are many hypotheses categories that need to be considered uh, prior to creating an intervention strategy for our patient. The first of these hypotheses categories is the activity and participation capability and restriction category. It's within this category that we have uh, spoken to our patient in particular through their history and asked them because they have a particular problem and perhaps in this case a shoulder pain what activities are they unable to do and what participation things relative to their societal needs are they unable to do so we look at these activity and participation restrictions then and develop a hypothesis uh, based upon uh, the patient's problem it's important to appreciate, however, that we also need to ask our patients what are they capable of doing. So while their capabilities may not lead to a particular hypothesis, what their capabilities do is provide us with a starting point relative to our intervention strategies. When working through our patient history, we also allow the patient the opportunity to speak to us and tell us their story and give us their particular meaning perspective for their particular problem. And through this uh, understanding of the patient's meaning perspective, we can then also develop hypotheses relative to this. So this may include things such as past injuries and how the patient responded to treatment from those prior injuries, their comfort level with manual therapy, or their comfort level with the type of treatment we may be willing to impart upon them. So you can also develop hypotheses uh, based upon the patient's meaning perspective. The next hypothesis category to discuss are pathobiological mechanisms. And it's within this category that we begin to hypothesize about the overall patient problem relative to the stage of healing of that problem and also relative to the pain mechanisms that may be uh, applicable here. So we're going to look at perhaps tissues and not specific to what tissues are involved at this point, but tissues more relative to their particular stage of healing. And we may also look at the pain mechanisms involved, in particular looking at whether or not the dominant pain category is an input issue, meaning that the pain is coming from the periphery, such as with nociceptors. Is it a processing issue in the central nervous system, or is it an output issue, such as a loss of motor control? So this pathobiological mechanisms can also then provide us with uh, some hypothesis about uh, our particular patient's problem. We can then consider hypotheses relative to physical impairments and the associated structures. So once we look at the pathobiological mechanisms, we can then begin to look more specifically at the physical impairments that the patient has presented with, which were likely measured during our objective data testing uh, opportunities. And at this point, we can then begin to think about specific structures that may be causing the particular impairments that we see. However, you have to realize that 
even with advanced technology that we have today relative to diagnostic imaging, etc., it's becoming increasingly more difficult to be 100% sure of a specific structure and treatment should be um, directed more toward treating the impairment as opposed to attempting to treat a specific structure. When we speak of contributing factors, we have to think about things such as patients' posture, their work-related um, activities, their home, school-related activities, any other things that may contribute to why the patient's symptoms developed in the first place. And we can generate hypotheses relative to these contributing factors, and these hypotheses uh, also need to be addressed when we consider the intervention strategies that we're going to carry out with our patients. We can also make hypotheses relative to precautions and contraindications based upon our initial assessment of our patient and perhaps from information provided by the physician and other healthcare providers. We can then make hypotheses relative to our management and treatment strategies. So we can look at the interventions that we are anticipating using with our patients and hypothesize whether or not these management strategies are in fact appropriate, uh, the best for the patient at this particular time based upon their stage of healing and other issues that we've already assessed. So making the hypothesis about your treatment uh, intervention and your management strategy would suggest that you feel that this is the most appropriate intervention for the patient at this time. And we also can make hypotheses relative to the patient's prognosis. So in this case, we look at all the information and the data we've collected. We look at the patient's meaning perspective, their past medical history, uh, our management strategies and our approach to this patient. And we can come up with some hypothesis relative to their prognosis. Does this patient have a good prognosis or is there some other factor, some contributing factor that may uh, make their prognosis less than good? So all of these hypotheses categories then will assist us uh, in developing uh, our treatment strategy for our patients. While the concept of clinical reasoning can be thought of as being a relatively simple and straightforward process, we have to appreciate that in reality it can be quite difficult to become efficient and effective in this process uh, because this process can be uh, fraught with many, many types of errors. So part of the process of becoming an expert clinician is to be able to recognize uh, the potential of errors developing and to be able to avoid them. Errors can occur at many stages within the clinical reasoning process, including the stages of perception, patient inquiry, interpretation of data, synthesis of data, planning our patient strategy, as well as reflection. Scott has identified three main causes of clinical reasoning errors. The first of these causes is deficient clinical skills. So this is a, an error whereby we may have uh, not developed the full set of clinical skills necessary to uh, adequately treat a patient problem. And as a result, the patient does not respond uh, appropriately or as well as we would like to see. The second would be deficient prepositional or professional craft knowledge. So once again, by not having the appropriate knowledge to draw from, and this knowledge not being organized in appropriate fashion, it may be difficult for us to sift through our database to come up with an appropriate clinical conclusion. And the last is deficient reasoning strategies. So it's in this particular case where we have a mal uh, application of our knowledge to a particular patient problem and therefore come up with the wrong strategy for our patient. Ravey and Jones then talk about various categories of clinical reasoning errors. 
The first of these categories is forming a wrong initial concept of the problem, and they refer to this as a framing error. This is a case where the clinician uh, fails to correctly interpret the initial data or critical cues that may have developed as part of our initial assessment process. This can then result in flawed or inadequate diagnosis as well as management decisions that are being formulated along the way. This type of error can be avoided by spending time carefully checking and interpreting the data that we've gained, uh, as well as questioning the validity uh, of the data that we've gathered and the picture that's being developed uh, about the patient. The second category for reasoning errors is a failure to generate plausible hypotheses and to test them uh, adequately. So if a clinician uh, misses cues or misinterprets clinical data, uh, they can then begin to formulate hypotheses that don't make sense. This problem can be further compounded if we don't recognize this er error early on and we continue down the path that we've chosen with our patient. So this faulty hypothesis testing then can lead to uh, perhaps incorporating inappropriate tests uh, for our patient uh, and wasting time and energy in attempting to go down a path that might not in fact be appropriate for our patient. So another category then can be inadequate testing and premature acceptance of our hypothesis. In this particular instant, uh, clinicians prematurely uh, accept hypotheses that they've generated and fail to go about further testing of that hypothesis to check to see if it is in fact correct. Uh, confirmational bias can result when cues that have been developed as a result of your data collection are selectively chosen and interpreted as being valid, thus favoring the hypothesis that you generated early on. So you have to be careful here about prematurely accepting a hypothesis without fully testing your, your hypothesis with appropriate tests and measures. Watt has further identified uh, errors in the clinical reasoning process and we'll mention some of them here. One is vagueness and under this uh, uh, error what we find is that the purpose of the evaluation or the treatment is unclear. A narrowness error is one using familiar approaches that seem effective without considering other approaches. So here you're using tunnel vision if you will in providing a treatment strategy for your patient uh, you're using a familiar approach without considering possibilities of other approaches. The error of rigidity is when a standardized process of examination and treatment are used without consideration of individualized patient needs and responses. So not all patients are going to respond the same way and so what we need to look at with each and every patient is how can we structure our examination process specific uh, for them and for their needs. Watt goes on to uh, further identify clinical reasoning errors as irrationality and this is when choices are based upon the latest fad or the latest course taken rather than on sound evidence. And very often clinicians will go off to a continuing education course and they'll come back saying that this particular idea, this particular concept, this particular technique is going to now be the magic bullet to solve all patient problems. So you need to be careful uh, when you go off to a continuing education course or learn an, a new concept that you don't let this cloud your mind um, rather than taking a look at whether or not this meets sound evidence. Wastefulness is another clinical reasoning error and this is uh, when providing costly intervention techniques without considering whether less expensive alternatives are equally as effective. Watt continues in his discussion of clinical reasoning errors by di discussing insensitivity. And with insensitivity, we're referring to here as ignoring patients' values and psychosocial concerns. 
as well as when physical performance improvements are valued higher than the quality of life improvements. It's not uncommon to see a patient who demonstrates improved mobility, improved activities within the clinical setting, but these can't be related to improvement in their quality of life. And very often the clinician has not taken the time to fully address with the patient their quality of life issues to be able to make the connection between physical improvements and quality of life improvements. And lastly, we talk about mystery. And it's here where clinical decisions cannot be explained in terms that the patient and the colleague can understand. Uh, this clinical reasoning error is part of your communication skills, which are necessary to help you and your patient come to a consensus about their problem and to get the patient to uh, effectively buy into the treatment strategies that you want to impart upon them. Christensen and I have also taken a look at the problem of errors in the clinical reasoning process. And what they have come up with is uh, a group of common errors that they have identified that can interfere with and affect the clinical reasoning process. The first is in the information collection process. And errors that can develop here are neglecting important information that the patient may be providing to you or neglecting important information that perhaps you might have collected in your objective information. Uh, also overemphasizing propositional or non-propositional knowledge uh, or evidence. Uh, other forms of information collection error may be basing decisions on insufficient evidence. Uh, perhaps you fail to detect inconsistencies in the clinical presentation with your patient. So make sure when you're collecting information that you're collecting rel relevant information and that you're analyzing this information effectively uh, so as to not have this be part of your reasoning error process. Uh, you can also develop error in your hypothesis formation. Uh, you may be focusing too much on a favorite hypothesis, or you may be considering too few hypotheses and thinking that there's only one or two uh, that might be appropriate. You may uh, prematurely be limiting the hypothesis considered, or perhaps you're reaching a firm decision prematurely. These are all things that can interfere with uh, the hypothesis formation portion of your clinical reasoning uh, process. There can also be errors in identifying vital cues, or in this case, various flags, whether they be red flags, blue flags, black flags, etc. And here what happens is we tend to miss precautions or contraindications uh, to treat our patient, and this can result uh, in potential harm for our patients. There can also be error in our diagnostic process. And in this case, we may miss a uh, relationship between symptoms or we may confuse relationship between symptoms. Uh, we may, um, in this case, overemphasize certain clinical findings that might be minor in the context of the whole patient presentation. Uh, there's many ways that we can create error then in our diagnostic reasoning process and in coming up with our clinical diagnosis. And we may also have error in our clinical reasoning relative to our treatments of patients. And a couple of common ones here are using clinical recipes as opposed to using clinical reasoning. We may also fail to involve the patient in our decision-making process. We may take unwarranted action with our patients. Uh, we may fail to monitor uh, the patient's response and even our own response to the reasoning process. So there's many errors that can happen relative to the development of our treatment strategies that we need to be aware of uh, as we're going through this process. So clinical reasoning then uh, requires reflection and it is thought that what one of the attributes that makes somebody a truly expert clinician is their ability to reflect. And you can look at reflection in two ways, reflection in action and reflection about action. And reflection in action refers to reflecting as you're going through the process of examining and evaluating your patient, whereby reflection about action is taking time to reflect after the fact. And what this reflection needs to be is a hard look at whether or not the data you've collected is meaningful, whether or not you've been truly objective in your decision-making process, whether or not you've done the best that you can to avoid uh, 
errors in your clinical reasoning process. So as I said, you can do this during the patient encounter, and you can also do this and should do this after the patient encounter. So when the patient has left for the day and you're considering what's happened with that patient, you should take a moment and reflect upon whether or not the treatment that you provided that day was in fact the best for that patient for that particular day. Uh, and the same holds true at the end of the whole patient encounter. When the patient's discharged or discontinued from your care, you should take time to go back and reflect upon that case and ask yourself whether or not the decisions that were made were truly the best decisions for that particular patient. Could some other intervention strategies have been done? Could you have used better inquiry skills to draw out the patient's uh, uh, perspective and the patient's story? Uh, could you have included the patient more in uh, development of goals and, and develop of the treatment strategy. So becoming a good self-reflector helps you appreciate where your personal deficiencies are so that you can continue to grow as a professional, seeking out more professional craft knowledge, seeking out more propositional knowledge, those things that will ultimately uh, improve the quality of your care for your patients. So how to improve the clinical reasoning process? Well, first we can consider developing a, what we call lateral thinking. And this is really restructuring old patterns into new ones and taking time to look at ways of doing things and develop new ways and new ideas or looking at a problem from a different perspective and a different angle. Basically, we're saying to stay open-minded. Uh, we do teach uh, very often in manual therapy programs and in musculoskeletal examination, specific ways of examining and evaluating patients. And today there's a big emphasis on clinical prediction rules and other things to attempt to look at and create patterns within our patients. But we also have to stay open-minded that perhaps three or four or five patients may have the same pattern, but perhaps the mechanism of injury is different or the contributing factors are different for these folks. Their meaning perspective may be different. Their lifestyles may be different. And as a result, they may in fact require different treatment strategies. So learning how to be open-minded, learning how to be a lateral thinker will help you to improve your clinical reasoning skills. When looking at patterns, understand the reasoning behind them. Don't simply look for the pattern and say, oh, okay, here's this collection of signs and symptoms. This is what we're going to do. It's more important, if you truly are going to become an expert clinician, to look at this collection of signs and symptoms, to look at this pattern, and to understand the reasoning why this pattern was there and why this pattern develops so that you can then focus your intervention strategy more appropriately. And you also need to be able to relate new knowledge and clinical experiences to previous knowledge. So every day in our clinics, we're seeing new things happening. New experiences are happening with our patients. We're seeing responses to treatments that perhaps are a little different than what we've seen before. And you need to be able to take this new knowledge and take these new clinical experiences and to interwove them with your previous knowledge to create a new subset so that you can then use on the next patient who presents with similar uh, signs and symptoms and similar patterns. As I said earlier, to become a truly expert clinician, you have to develop critical self-reflection skills. Each and every one of us continues to grow as a professional every day. And one of the ways we do this is to look within ourselves to see where we can improve. What have we done with our patients and what could we have done better? Perhaps our patient responded the way we hoped that they would respond and they actually got better and they attained their goals in a certain number of visits. Well, is there something that we could have done that may have allowed them to attain that goal sooner? Uh, is there something we could have done to assure that the patient won't uh, re-injure themselves? So this critical self-reflection really is what separates an expert clinician from an experienced clinician. As you go through this process of self-reflection, what you look at is the reliability and the validity of information obtained. So was the information that I got through my subjective and objective uh, examination process reliable and was it valid in helping me make the decision that I needed to make? Did I, in fact, 
provide tests and measures to the patient that were unnecessary, that clouded the issue? Did I not do all the appropriate tests and measures that could have been there? We also need to critically reflect upon the patient's meaning perspective and make sure that we include the patient in the process, asking the patient, talking to the patient about their particular problem, uh, and including them in the process of decision making relative to goals and treatment strategies. We need to look for supporting and refuting evidence for our decisions, and this means continuing to read the professional literature, to look at the evidence relative to the intervention strategies that we're trying to impart upon our patients. Now, while we know that there's many, many, many treatment approaches that have still been shown to be effective and have not yet been put to the test of the research, there is a growing body of evidence that is supporting the manual therapy uh, interventions that we are using on our patients today. And so it's important to have a good understanding of the literature relative to the efficacy of manual therapy uh, and to be able to use this information to support your clinical decision making, as well as to refute other decisions that you're, or other treatment strategies that you may be considering. You have to ask yourself, is your knowledge sufficient to make sound judgments about your patient's problem? And if not, what new knowledge do you need to seek out? What additional continuing education do you need to go to, uh, after to increase your particular knowledge base? How can I better organize my knowledge within my uh, own memory banks to be able to draw on this knowledge more effectively for our patients in the future? We need to develop a lifelong learning process, and you've heard us talk a great deal about the need to be lifelong learners, but truly expert clinicians are lifelong learners. They thrive and they thirst for new knowledge because they knew that this knowledge, this new knowledge will make them better and will ultimately allow them to impart more efficient and effective intervention strategies on their patients. So to be a truly expert clinician, you have to commit yourself here and now to being a lifelong learner. And you need to also commit yourself to peer review. When working in the clinical setting, it's always helpful to work in a setting where you have peers who you can draw from, who you can ask questions of, who you can ask to look over a patient record and give their judgments as to uh, your particular decision-making process and your intervention skills. And not only clinicians you work with, but if you can develop a circle of peers that you trust to make critical uh, analysis of your work, you will become a stronger clinician as a result, as will they. So peer review becomes a very, very important process of becoming an expert clinician, involving uh, your peers in your development and involving yourself in developing of your peers. So in conclusion, then, we can take a look at our learning objectives. And after going through this presentation, you should now have an understanding of the timeline relative to the clinical decision-making process and appreciate that clinical decision-making begins the moment you open your patient's file. We talked about what is the definition of clinical reasoning and we talked about it being a process. You should be able to identify and explain variables that affect the clinical reasoning process, whether they're attributes of the patient, attributes of the clinician, attributes of the environment. You should be able to discuss hypothesis-oriented decision-making with respect to hypothesis categories, to compare and contrast diagnostic versus narrative reasoning and understand the difference between the two and how important narrative reasoning really is in the decision-making process. You should be able to explain the value of reassessment in the reasoning process and how every patient encounter should be a reassessment relative to that which you've given the patient before and that which you're planning on giving the patient in the future. You should be able to discuss pattern recognition with respect to clinical reasoning, appreciate the need for collaboration in particular with our patients, but also with caregivers and other health professionals in the clinical reasoning process,
discuss the various types of knowledge involved in clinical reasoning, including propositional knowledge, professional craft knowledge, etc. You should have a good understanding of causes and categories of clinical reasoning errors, and you should be able to identify and explain common clinical reasoning errors. And most importantly, you should be able to, at this point, identify and understand ways to improve the clinical reasoning process. So I hope this presentation has given you a little bit more information about clinical reasoning, and you should now be able to use this information uh, to take to the next step your ability to interact with your patients and develop an efficient and effective strategy for them so that ultimately you can have more successful patient outcomes.